Welcome to the first module of the C-Learning series on financial modeling for public-private partnerships brought to you by the World Bank and DFID. In this module, we will briefly review the public-private partnership definition and its guiding principles. We will also learn the role of financial analysis in determining public-private partnership feasibility. It is important to remind you that this mode of teaching is a participatory one. That means that you will be learning from the knowledge and experience of others, such as yourself. Let's begin this module by reviewing key public-private partnership terms and concepts. i got a question for you. What's the hardest thing in putting a, uh, a public-private partnership together? Is it, is it the financing? Is it is putting together the financing for the project? Who thinks, who thinks it's raising the money for the project? Is it, who thinks it's something else? Yes, it, it is something else, and we'll learn about that. The financing of these projects is math. Uh, it's gonna work, it's not gonna work. If it's not working, you have to figure out how to make it work. To make it work, a lot of the times, that's gonna involve public policy decisions, and that's why you're here, okay? So let's, uh, let's get right into it. Our objective here is not simply to turn you into expert financial modelers and uh, what sometimes we refer to as spreadsheet experts, spreadsheet jockeys to be able to manipulate Excel spreadsheets. You're going to learn some of that. You're going to pick up some of that if you don't know it already. But that's not the objective. The objective is, is to how to interpret the results you, you may be using transaction advisors to put, put this material together. Even Ned or myself might be helping you on a project. You're, you're the decision makers. You're the policy influencers. You will need to kind of understand the concepts, what, what the results are showing you. It's not, and you have to have an appreciation at how the results were arrived at. Uh, so that's what we'd like to, for you to get from this week. Okay, so before we begin, I just want to have a quick review of some of our, our terms and definitions and concepts so that we're all informed as we get into the financial analysis. So, uh, public-private partnership, there are a lot of different definitions for it. It sometimes means different things to different people. Uh, I don't get too overly concerned on how you define it. Uh, my preferred phrase, which I, even though it's preferred, I don't use that often, is uh, al alternative delivery technique, alternative delivery method. Uh, it's, it's doing something different than traditionally funding a project, right? So uh, just as maybe as a, as a quick review, remember, let's say, let's take uh, an example. If we were to uh, have, we're in the government and we need to build a bridge, right? We need to build a bridge and we design, we're in the government and we design the bridge. We might even hire an engineer to design us the bridge. And they come up with uh, a design, we see what it looks like and we're happy with it as uh, being in the government. And now uh, we, through the budgeting process, we obtain money to build the bridge, but we hire a private construction company to build it. So we're now we're gonna have a private construction company build the bridge. And the private construction company builds it, delivers it to us. We're happy with the bridge that the private construction company built, and we pay them. Is that a public-private partnership? We're gonna use uh, public money but we're gonna have a private company build it. Is that a public-private partnership? Who thinks it is not? Go ahead and raise your arm. Okay, back here, right here. Got a couple, got a few back here. All right, very good. That is not what we mean by a public-private partnership. Even though we're gonna use a private company, there really isn't much shifting of risk. Uh, it doesn't really kind of contain the characteristics of a public-private partnership. So when I think of a definition of public-private partnerships, I'm thinking more in terms of elements. So these are the elements. The 
Typically, not always though, but typically it will involve a long-term contract. These are, tend to be long agreements. It could be 15, 20, 30-year agreements, could even be more. It's something that's in the interest of the public. So a bridge, a school, a water facility, those are public interest projects. The bridge helps people get to and from different places to get to work, to move uh, goods uh, to the market. It's good for the economy. The school obviously facilitates learning. Those are all in the public interest. A water facility that produces clean water, that's good for health. A hotel, on the other hand, it's hard to justify that as being a public-private partnership. It's hard to think about the building of a hotel, as much as we like being here at the Ramada, uh, is, a pub, is in the public interest. That's, that's more in the commercial interest. It's not really necessarily the public interest. There's a big transfer of risk. In that earlier example, when I said the private construction company was going to build the bridge that the government designed and paid for, and the government will operate, there's very little risk transfer. You know, maybe it takes two years to build the bridge, and the construction company is going to assume some risk. You know, for instance, if they don't build it properly, or if they take too long to build it, They'll, they'll have some penalties, but it's not a substantial amount of risk transfer because that bridge hopefully lasts 50 or more years. Maybe a, I know there are bridges that have lasted more than 100 years. If there was something wrong with the design, that's the government's risk. If the, uh, something happens to the bridge over those 100 years, that's the government's risk. So there is no, there's very little transfer risk. In public-private partnerships, risk will be transferred. And, oh, I should mention, uh, one of the things we will focus on this week is risk. Uh, we'll talk about what is risk, what are risk, how do you quantify risk. There's a cost associated with that. Private financing. Now, it doesn't mean that every public-private partnership is fully financed by the private sector. But uh, we, are, we can use private financing and uh, this is a big, big component for these public-private partnerships. The other thing that's uh, important is, the other way to think of private financing is maybe the compensation they receive. So going back to the issue of contracts, we like to think of these as performance-based contracts. They're going to they're gonna get paid for performing, not simply paid for delivering. There's a, there's a difference there, and we'll, we'll discuss that in a moment. And now the other big one is focusing on what the asset is going to do. So when, uh, when the government decides to build a school, to build a, a bridge, to build a water plant, they design it. Now, they may have a private company build it, but basically what they're doing is they're coming up with the blueprints, what it's going to look like, uh, how big it's going to be, uh, how much water it's going to produce, how many cars, vehicles are going to be able to go uh, across the bridge, what the bridge is going to look like. Those are all inputs. And so sometimes we call these uh, uh, bid-build contracts. So you know, the government will design the, the project uh, they'll come up with the drawings, for instance, and then they will put those drawings out for bid for construction companies to bid on. And the, construct the construction company that provides the lowest cost bid, as long as they're responsible, they win. Here, it's a, it's a different mindset. Now, what we're focusing on is the output of the project. The it puts the government in a different position. You're, in the government now, you're not designing the project. You're saying what you want the project to do. We want the school to educate this many children. We want the bridge to allow this many vehicles. We want uh, so much water to be come out. You, the private sector, you come up with the design. You come up with the innovation on how are you going to accomplish these things. So it's a contract for a public interest project that transfers substantial risk, that includes private 
financing and focuses on output specifications. That's the reminder. That's how I'd like you to think of a public-private partnership. You should remain familiar with the public-private partnership project cycle. Uh, this is how here in Tanzania it's defined. And it's, you know, you go around the world, it might look a little differently. The, there's some that some countries have uh, very involved uh, processes uh, in terms of defining their cycle. But this, these are the basic elements wherever you go. I mean, first you have to identify a project. By the way, and it's not simply uh, identifying a project, uh, it is uh, it's screening the project, okay? Not all public-private partnership, not all projects should be pursued as public-private partnerships. We want to screen them. They, we want to see that they have the characteristics that lend themselves to being a public-private partnership. Just real quickly, what are, uh, what are some of the characteristics that would make a, a project uh, suitable, if you will, for a public-private partnership, for, public, for PPP delivery? If you were given a long list of potential projects, for instance, uh, in government, we have capital budgets. Capital budgets are a long list of uh, potential projects that the government would like to see built. If you, you're in government, you were given that list, how would you kind of then figure out which projects uh, maybe should be delivered by the government and which should be delivered by the private sector? Are there any characteristics or suitability? Yes, I will look if uh, the project is financial, and economically viable. Right. You want it, is it financially, economically viable? Uh, you, this is not going to be a week on uh, identification and screening, but things, other uh, things you want to look for, is it legally possible to do? The other part is uh, you want to really focus on, has it been done before? Are there examples? Is there, if you uh, put this out for bid, is, are people going to show up and bid on it? Yes, did you uh, have a... The project that most of the risks can be transferred to the private part. Oh, very good. Does it, is it able to trans... Are you able to transfer risk? That's important. So those are the general things uh, you like to look for. Has it been done before as a public-private partnership? Or are you going to be the first one to try this? Uh, those are some of the screening uh, suitability characteristics. Feasibility, uh, this is... This is the viability of the question. This is looking at the different factors uh, on, or this is answering the question, can we do this project? It's answering kind of two questions, really. First, is it even possible to do the project? Forget about whether it's going to be done as a public-private partnership or, uh, or if the government's going to deliver it. You know, can we legally do it? Is it technically possible? And is it financially possible? By the way, another one, is it politically possible to do it? Uh, so the, we're going to spend this week focusing on the question, uh, this issue in feasibility, uh, the financial analysis. This is where our financial analysis uh, takes place during this feasibility phase. Uh, our third phase is procurement. This is uh, marketing the opportunity, identifying uh, who's going to bid on our project. And then contract management. Well, uh, these, those first three phases might take 18 months, might take 24 months, might even take three years. This phase is our longest by far. Uh, we could have a contract that lasts for 30 years. We need to monitor and evaluate and manage that contract uh, for those 30 years. So uh, this is getting back to, these are performance-based contracts. Uh, and for them to, uh, to make sure they're performing, we have to monitor it. So those, those are our four phases. I'm going to ask you, why, why do governments pursue public-private partnerships? What motivates them to implement PPPs? I think the government wants the private partnership, wants the private party to pursue PPP because 
it think it, co it e can deliver it better compared to the government. So one of it is for better delivery of services. Any, what are some of the other reasons? Yes. Financing the project. They, uh, it, the private sector may have better access to financing, to funding the project. Okay. Any others? Oh, yes. Okay. A risky transfer to the private party. Yeah, so risk, uh, that's going to be an important element. Uh, risk involves a cost. And if you can shift that cost to the private partner, you lower the government's risk exposure. It's cost of the project. So those are all very good reasons. The, uh, so uh, efficiency, you mentioned uh, better able to deliver the project. That's our efficiency equation. Uh, project delivery you also mentioned. The lack of fiscal space, that means that the government may not have enough money for the project, okay? Uh, so the private sector can do so. Value for money, you were talking about risk transfer. Uh, I want to just, this kind of depicts uh, some of that real quickly. This is the government over on this column. This is the public-private partnership over here. Why do you think uh, the private sector might be able to build something, the same project, the same bridge? Why is the construction cost maybe lower in a public-private partnership than if it's traditional government delivery? In a PPP, uh, construction and operation are tied together. Construction and operation are tied together. Yes, they are in a yes. public-private partnership. What motivates a private partner to involve themselves in a public-private partnership? Is it because they want to be a good citizen? What's, yes, right here. The intention of private partner is to increase their profits. The private partner wants to make money. Yes, they do. They, it's profit. They want to make money. Don't forget that. Now, they can make money, they can earn the profit, by delivering a public service, but they want to make money. So, in a public-private partnership, the private partner can't make money until the project's built. The sooner it's built, the faster they can make money. Very important. And this cost, this construction cost, these capital costs, this is their money, not government money. So they want to earn a return on that money, and it's at risk. So the faster they get that project online, the faster they can, as you said, earn a profit. So construction costs are a little lower. The financing costs, this is the cost of actually, uh, fin financing is not necessarily funding. They're two different things. Financing is, for instance, if you have to borrow money, you have to pay interest on that money that you borrow. Well, in almost every instance, the government's cost of borrowing money is actually typically lower than the private sector. Uh, there's, uh, and we're going to learn why uh, in a moment, but it has to do with risk. So the government may actually, in government delivery, have lower financing costs. Operations maintenance, this is to run the project over the life of the project. Studies show it's usually higher than the private sector. Why? Why is it higher? Think back to why uh, government construction costs might be higher than private sector. And the private sector may use a lower cost in maintenance, um, maintaining the asset. So what are the typical uh, uh, techniques this private sector use? Oh, OK. Uh, yeah. so, it's, uh, so the question is, uh, if they have lower operations and maintenance costs, the private sector, what, what, are the, what are their techniques? How do they do that? Well, it's not, there's, it's, there's nothing magical about it. It's not like, I mean, they may have access to better technology. You mentioned technology. They might have that, and they, but they, they have systems in terms of doing this. Uh, and it's just being much more efficient and diligent and how they're spending their money. Because it's their money. And just as, you know, when you spend things, when you go shopping, 
right? When you go shopping, when you, when you go to market, you're going to be very diligent how you use your money. And it's their money that they're using. Now, being diligent when you go shopping doesn't necessarily mean you're going to buy something inferior. You're going to try to get the best value you can. And that's the same principle that they're using. When I'm talking about the private sector, the private sector is too smart in terms of specific, measurable, attainable. So when you're employed in the private sector, expect to deliver. Quite different from the public sector. Let's say, for example, you have employed in the private sector, you are supposed to deliver in terms of target. That at the end of the day, you have to reach, let's say, 90% of the target of the, of the company, which you may find that is quite different from the public sector. Even if you not deliver the target, which is required, let's say, 50 or what, you can find that we don't care. So you can find the also there is issue of the time, time measurable. Let's say, for example, the private sector is something has find that there is damage or there is an accident. And the, it should be done maintenance as soon as possible so that the business can go on, can take on, so that everything will be in the production and the service will be provided. So that's you can find that there is some kind of difference from the private sector and the, and the public sector. That's All just right. to compliment from what thank you, you yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Well, here's the big one. When, uh, when the government designed and financed and is operating that bridge over the life of the bridge, if something happens to the bridge, or it could be a school, or it could be a water facility, whose responsibility is it? Something goes wrong, whose responsibility is it? It's the government's, right? Well, the possibility of something going wrong is what risk is. Okay. So when the government delivers the project and the government operates the project, when the government pays for the project, the government is retaining, that is keeping, all of the risk, 100% of the risk. The private partner, as long as the, what their, is their project's fully functioning, they get paid, the government pays them. This is why contract management and project evaluation and monitoring is so important. So in this case, with street lights, they're all working properly. They've been maintained properly at the end of the payment period, whether it's a monthly basis, quarterly basis, the private partner receives their full payment. If they're not working properly, if they're not doing something they're supposed to do, uh, they receive less than their full payment. For instance, in a school, if a window's broken in the school, the public-private partnership agreement will be very specific. It will say, uh, for instance, that uh, if a broken window is reported, and they have, these things generally have what they call uh, facility management systems. They can be, it can be fairly sophisticated software. If the, a broken window is reported, the contract will say something to the effect that the broken window, for instance, must be repaired within 24 hours. Uh, and when it's repaired, let's say it's repaired in 10 hours, it's the, uh, there's a closeout report, the window's repaired, it's done. Well, if it takes three days to repair the window, the private partner doesn't repair it for three days, that'll be noted in the system. And at the end of the month, all of these points are deductions, and the private partner doesn't get their full payment. You can see what happens. The private, there's a powerful incentive for the private partner to perform. Because if they don't, you, you said their, their motivation is profit. Well, they're not going to earn as much profit as they could if they don't perform. So we have availability payments. This is a form of revenue in a public-private partnership. What we also have are user fees that are just that. If, uh, when you, if you take the ferry here in uh, Dar es Salaam to get across the harbor, you pay to get on that ferry. That's a user fee. If you use the, the BRT, the bus rapid transit, uh, here in Dar es Salaam, you pay a fare. That is a user fee. 
uh, bridge toll, road toll, uh, your water tariff, your uh, uh, electricity bill, the tariff you have for that. Those are all user fees. You're using something and you're paying for it. There's really five principles that, uh, that drive public-private partnerships. We had, one of them is values for money, which we just discussed. We also have this one, affordability for public-private partnerships. We say affordable, but who does the project need to be affordable to? Users, Users right? So if the BRT here in uh, DAR, right? If, if, you, if you charge too much, people won't use it. Right? So it has to be affordable to them. Who else does the project need to be affordable for? Government. The government. Right. Very good. The, so the users and the government, we have to find affordability. And it's not always the same thing. You're going to see that this week, uh, how that plays out. We have affordability. And that sometimes clashes with what we call bankability or commercial viability. What is bankability of a public-private partnership? What it means is it, the project's going to generate enough that it can borrow money, because most of these projects require some kind of loan. Uh, it also means that the private investor, there's enough profit, enough revenue or net cash flow that can be generated from the project that the private investor can make a sufficient return, what they think is a return necessary for them to invest in the project. All right? So vi commercial viability and bankability. Those it will give you some really, I think, good examples and actual financial analysis where sometimes those two principles, affordability, bankability, might clash. So for instance, if uh, uh, not unlike the bus rapid transit system, if you were to do a financial analysis, you might find out that, okay, the, the fare for getting on the BRT needs to be, well, you tell me, has anyone been on the BRT? What's the fare? How many shillings? Let's say the longest ride. 650? 650 shillings. Okay, so let's say the longest ride on the BRT is 650 shillings. I think one of the things you will find out if you were to dig into it, that 650 shilling, it, first of all, may very well be affordable to the users of the BRT. It even might be a little on the high side, but it might be affordable. But it's not, I think what you, I have not looked at the finances of the BRT, but I'm confident in saying that the 650 shilling fare is not sufficient to pay the operating costs of the BRT. To be fully bankable, to be fully commercially viable, you may find out the 650 shillings really might need to be 1,500 shillings to be fully commercially viable, to be bankable. Okay? Well, that makes it great for the private party in terms of making it bankable, but now it becomes what for the users? It becomes unaffordable. It's not affordable. This is what I mean when you have to make policy decisions. What happened, like in the case of the BRT, they lower the cost of the fare. Well, then the project, if they lower the cost of the fare, the, the project's no longer bankable. So now you start seeing there's some tension between viability, excuse me, between affordability and bankability. And they gotta, we got to figure that out. Now, you as policymakers, as decision makers, this is what I mean when it comes to interpreting this financial analysis. Uh, somebody can generate a lot of that work for you. Okay? Your transaction advisors can put that together, those sheets. But you now, you have to understand what they're telling you from this. And there's going to be some policy decisions made. We'll, we'll go through some examples of that. The next two I'll go through really quickly. We want a project to be 
manageable. You have to evaluate if the private party's performing. That's a lot of our uh, manageability. And the big one, acceptability. Uh, this is the, uh, this really has to do with our uh, political situation, or more importantly, our stakeholders. This, I said financing is not the most difficult part of a public-private partnership. This is. These, uh, the managing stakeholder expectations uh, is not easy. It's probably the hardest part of a PPP. It's also probably the most important. Don't be upset that the private partner is earning a profit. Uh, sometimes people do get upset that they're like, why should a private partner make money for doing something that's for the public? Well, the, the answer to that is if they can, if they can earn a profit uh, while doing something that's good for the public and it pr provides better value for those that use the service, those that you pay for the service, which are taxpayers, then, it's, then it is a good thing. Uh, the other one is uh, we don't want to burden our private partner with bureau bureaucratic inertia. This is, uh, this is one of the reasons we try to involve the private sector. We want to get their, we want to harness their innovation don't, don't bog them down with uh, public processes. All right, so uh, in that uh, second phase uh, of our PPP project cycle, we have uh, feasibility studies. This is, ugh, this is a whole, like looking at all the various steps in uh, feasibility analysis. But we're concentrating on this one, financial analysis. Uh, we want to know is can we make a project that's affordable and bankable? That's what this is going to help answer. Okay, uh, is it going to make it uh, bankable? Is the government going to have to contribute to the project? Does it make sense for the government to contribute to the project? So we need to know how much it costs to build something, or have estimate what it's going to cost to build something. These are our direct costs. It's also uh, how much is it going to cost to operate it? All right. How much is it going to cost to maintain it over its life? These are all the costs that go into a project. It's also good to take a look at what the indirect costs are. Uh, there's going to be um, uh, there's going to be costs, uh, what we call overhead costs, that may not be directly related to the project. Uh, the way I like to explain it is uh, you have stop signs. If a stop sign gets knocked down, uh, how much does it cost to replace the stop sign? Well, certainly we got to have a new sign. That's a direct cost. We got to have uh, some laborers or some workers go out and put the new sign, take down the old sign, put the new sign in. That's a direct labor cost. Well, it's not just that cost. The, the truck they use to get out there. It costs money to run the truck. That's an indirect cost. That's overhead. The, their boss who told them to go out and replace the sign, he's overhead. You gotta allocate that. So those are indirect costs. What are our revenues in a public-private partnership? What kind of revenues do we have? I heard user fees and what else? Availability payments, very good. So this is our project revenue. Uh, we're gonna, we, we have to understand how much is the project gonna earn in terms of revenue. Again, whether it's generated through user fees such as fares, tolls, tariffs, or an availability payment. That is how much is the government going to pay the private operator. Our financing, our financing is how much is it going to cost to borrow money? How much uh, it, do we know what, uh, what is equity? What is equity? Yes. Yeah, shillings, cash. Okay, and boy, we got like 1,000 notes. So 
I don't have a lot of shillings on me. Well, it's, uh, there's, there's really, in financing, there's, there's two primary components. There's equity, which is cash that comes out of the pocket of the investors. And there's debt, which uh, the phrase we like to use, it's other people's money. It means we're going to borrow money. We're going to borrow money from somewhere. Well, we have to, when we build our model, we're going to have to understand what's the, for the investors, if they're going to invest, what's their required rate of return? What, how much money do they want to make by investing money? And we also have to understand if they're going to borrow money, what's the, what's the bank uh, or the lender going to require in terms of interest? Okay, that's, that's our financing component. Is the government going to financially support the project? One of the things you'll learn is in a public-private partnership doesn't mean, does not always mean that the private sector is going to 100% fund the project. Okay, sometimes it's going to be necessary for the government to play a role in that as well. So when we have those elements, we can uh, build our model, we can take our model, we can adjust it for risk, and you'll see the means uh, that how we do that. And we can also have sensitivity analysis, which does not mean that we're going to get in touch with our feelings. Okay, Sens we're not going to look how, how sensitive are we about this. No, we want to start stressing the model. You know, what if there's less demand than anticipated? What if the inflation rate is higher? What if uh, uh, the foreign exchange rates uh, change. We want to uh, start taking a look at those things and what happens. If you were going to build a big new water facility, uh, it might be a risky project, uh, certainly when you're starting out. Companies, if and you're going to do it through a uh, public-private partnership, companies don't want to be fully exposed to that risk. They're all about trying to reduce their risk as well. So they'll form uh, sometimes you'll hear the phrase SPV, which stands for Special Purpose Vehicle or a Special Project Company or spe Special Project Vehicle. I've heard it used different ways. Uh, but SPV, they'll form actually a new company for that one project. And that new company will, uh, will be capitalized. That means equity will put in the cash and debt will be put in. The new company will borrow the money. Uh, and all the lending for it. When you, if you buy a house and you borrow money to buy a home, or if you buy a car and you borrow, uh, borrow money to buy a car, what does the bank do? They look at your credit rating. Are you a good risk? Can, can we expect this person to repay the, the loan? And if they don't, what's the bank's security? They'll come after your home. They'll come after your car. They'll come after your savings accounts to get the loan repaid. Well, this, this, this thing called an SPV has no history, has no credit history. And uh, this happens to be a, a water desalination plant. Banks don't want to own water desalination plants, I can tell you. So, you know, even though they might be worth a lot of money, they don't want, they don't want those things. So they don't have what we call collateral. So the only thing they're going to bank, uh, base their lending decision on, I shouldn't say the only thing, but the primary thing they're going to lend it, uh, base it on, is the cash flows of the project. This is our financial analysis again. Is the project going to, and here's where the word bankability comes from, is the project going to generate enough cash flow to service the debt, okay? And the banks are going to rely on the contract. Public-private partnerships are held together by a contract. That's because this new company has no operating history. They need to look at the contract. So this is this new project company. Uh, Gandalf, who just walked out, he mentioned shareholders. They're going to put in the equity, which is the cash, right? Uh, here are the lenders. This is where they're going to borrow the money. They're going to put in the debt. The, uh, here's the company that's going to build it. They're going to be the construction company. Here's, uh, they might use a separate company to operate the project. 
Here's the government, the granting authority, or sometimes called contracting authority, CA. They're going to have an agreement, uh, in this case a concession agreement. Uh, sometimes uh, here are the users who are going to use the service. Let's say it's a toll bridge, the BRT. Uh, and if uh, you need supplies, you can even have an input supplier. What do you think each of these lines represents? What are each of those lines? They're contracts. All of those things are contracts. There's all these different contracts. You need lawyers for all these things, law firms and everything. You can see why the transaction costs for these larger projects can become quite substantial. Uh, the imp another important thing, the reason they use this method, this helps isolate risks. If anything goes wrong, the only exposure the investors have is what they put in. It's not it could be another company up here, but they're only exposed to, uh, to, the, to the level of the cash they invested. If everything goes wrong, they lose their cash, but they don't lose their parent company. Uh, the other thing that's uh, kind of a unique thing about uh, this structure is the lending. Sometimes they refer to as non-recourse finance or limited recourse finance. If you default on your car payment, on your car loan, or you default on your house loan, what happens? The bank will take your car away, right? They'll take your home away. They, will, they may even seize your savings because they want to get their loan repaid. And you know what? As awful as that is, they're, they're entitled to get, you made a promise you were going to repay their loan. Well, in this model, what non-recourse or limited recourse means is that if this company fails, if that bridge project fails, the bridge might be up, bridge might be cars and trucks are able to use the bridge, but it fails as a public-private partnership, meaning the, the private company goes bankrupt, doesn't make enough money. Well, the bank cannot go after the shareholders. All they can do, they, all, the only thing they have is this project company. And so it's a pretty neat structure. It doesn't mean, it doesn't mean the shareholders have to pay off the loan. Just another phrase uh, to become familiar with is pro forma. Uh, pro forma is the, essentially the future prediction of cash flows. Uh, this, this is our spreadsheet. Uh, this is, you'll see, this is what generates the, uh, the financial analysis. Uh, so uh, you'll, it's basically cash flows over time or, or life of the project, life of the agreement. Sometimes you'll hear something called the waterfall. So, so here are the shareholders, the investors. Here's the bank, uh, the operator, the construction company. So money comes in. Who gets paid first? The, first? the first person to get paid, or first group that gets paid, is the construction company has to get paid for building it, okay? But the operator always gets paid first. If the operator doesn't get paid and walks off the job, we don't have a project. Even the bank, as much as they want to get paid back, they will insist the operator gets paid first. And there's kind of, won't waste time saying how that happens, but they, they will actually mandate that in their agreement that the operator gets paid first. Having taken a look at PPP management and requirements, my colleague Ned White will now take you through public-private partnership financial analysis. He will also lead you through some case examples. This first part here is, as we're calling it, the time value of money calculations. Now again, I want to provide a little bit of a, uh, let's, before we get down into the weeds and the details of this, let's understand what it is we want our financial models to tell us. Even if you don't have a financial background, what is it that we're really seeking from a PPP financial model? Here's a general checklist of the things I think are no most important. Number one, when we do financial models in the feasibility study phase, what we really want to know, most importantly, how much revenue is this project going to require to be financially sustainable? 
and that revenue can either come from end user fees or it can come from availability payments. But what we want to know is to cover all of its costs and to be sustainable so that the business, and when we say sustainable, this means will it be there again tomorrow? Is it earning enough money to cover its costs so that it will be there for its entire planned life, such as for 20 years? What is the revenue, the approximate revenue needed to cover all costs? Um, meaning, and as John mentioned, acceptable to private investors as well as bankable. You could say that for commercial lenders. We'll get into more details on that. We want to know how much it will be in terms of end user fees. Break down the revenue a little bit and say, well, how much does this actually mean in per unit costs, tariffs, or fares, or tariffs per unit costs for end users, or availability payments for contracting authorities? <clears throat> so we can determine, is it affordable? In some sectors, maybe it's water or electricity, we may even have certain affordability limits set. It may be that a sector regulator like Iwura might have set tariffs for water or electricity, and we're going to want to compare our PPP project to it. If we do the PPP project, will end user tariffs still be within that affordability limit? Um, <clears throat> we're also going to want to know for any private investor, how much is the upfront investment going to cost? There's a fancier name for that, it's called the capital investment. But it's basically saying if we want to start out with this project, whether it's a marketplace, a bus terminal, you name it, how much new investment is going to be required before we can begin operations? Any private investor, especially PPPs, where we're looking to our private partners to fund that initial investment. How much is it going to be, approximately? Uh, when we do value for money analysis, one of the things that we look at in value for money analysis is a comparison. We want to compare the total costs of a PPP project with the total costs of the project if the same project were done by the government and comparing those two. That's one of the elements in a value for money analysis. So that's it, another thing that our financial model sh modeling should tell us. Which option offers the better value for money? Um, we also mentioned sort of things like stress testing. John mentioned this, also called sensitivity analysis. What would happen to the project if we test out risks? Typical risks might be, what if the construction costs were actually higher than anticipated? What if construction costs were 20% higher? What if the revenues received or the market and demand for the project was 20% lower? Or what if there are changes in inflation? These are simple things that I hope you're going to be able to do with another's financial model if it's properly designed. And one of the things I want you to do is become better clients of the work of PPP consultants demanding and requiring that your consultants give you something that you can test out and use. And sometimes there are consultants who take shortcuts or there are consultants in a very practical world who might give you certain models that are inflexible. <clears throat> I mean, what if somebody gave you, designed for you a car and the steering wheel is fixed? You can't turn it. And they may say, well, we just assume that you're going to use this car, that you're going to use this vehicle to go from point A to point B. What could you ever need, you know, that's sort of a, and you're asking me to do additional work to actually put a steering wheel in it. Well, this is some practical advice of making sure that in the terms of reference, making sure when you oversee consultants that they include things in your car, not only like a steering wheel that works, but an accelerator, brakes, you're going to want to see all of the measures. One thing you'll hear me say a number of times, never rely on one single number or one single indicator to tell you if a PPP is financially feasible or not. Well, when presenting those materials, uh, we appreciate you mentioned the uh, point on, on uh, how important it is to, is to make sure the financial model is realistic. So here we have a challenge uh, in the government. So, so far, so, uh, 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 when you are making this discussion, mm -hmm. we request you to 
to, to, to have more discussion on how to make, how, what, what the techniques can, can help us to make, uh, to be aware sure. whether the financial model is realistic or not. Yes. So uh, uh, some of the consultants might present uh, data which is of, uh, optimistic or which is not true for uh, altogether. Mm -hmm. All the assumptions are not true. Yep. And uh, more important, import, importantly, the financial model could come up with a conclusion that uh, you know demands the government to support the project, while the government should not. Yeah. So this is extremely important for us to understand. Yeah. Yep. The financial model could be concluded, for example, the model, the, 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 the project is not worth. Mm -hmm. Or the, you know, it is having negative cash flow throughout. Sure. But while, when, you, when you try to see the project, you see people, you know, uh, de uh, demanding the service, yeah? Uh, you know, the, 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 you, you see high demand. People, people are demanding the service, yeah? Contrary to what the model is telling you. So. Sure. When we are, we are making this discussion all, all over the week, we need also the participants to understand mm -hmm. how to assess the financial models to make sure that they, they to, to assess whether they are real, realistic or not. Yep. Yeah, I think you mentioned something on that here. Yeah. Sure. What I'll do is I want to give you at least some of an understanding of the basic, some of this is going to be theoretical. As we move along, then I want you to become more comfortable in some of the practical issues. Like as we'll see in financial models, as uh, John mentioned, they rely on input assumptions. And one of the things I want you to do is be comfortable identifying, well, where are the assumptions? And also sort of questioning, well, where is the assumption data? Where did you get the data? Is it recent? Uh, is it harmonized? Uh, you can find, again, consultants, they may take shortcuts and say, well, we're taking a cost estimate from a study that was done two years ago, and we're plugging that in, and we're taking other input data elsewhere you might find that, well, really, it's relying on second and third hand data that might be out of date. You really need something that's more, more up to date. I'll, t I'll give you some more practical guidelines in this case. But for now, I want you to understand pretty clearly, before we really talk about any measures of financial analysis, does it provide us with clear answers to some very basic questions? How much money are we going to, how much revenue is it going to require? through the life of the contract? What would the tariffs be and are they affordable? What provides better value for money? And then also a big one is oftentimes what level of risk sharing by the public sector is required? Because one of the things we find when we do financial analyses, I've seen them, our first version of them oftentimes shows the project's not affordable yet or uh, it's not bankable yet. Now, how could we structure the project, usually with more public sector risk sharing or contributions, to make it bankable? Let's use the financial model to do that, but as I say, let's do that in an informed way. So we're not just blindly, I'd say, t assuming risks or making contributions, but we know if we make this contribution, we should expect the returns to be at this level. Here's how we know exactly how much we need to, or uh, a good idea of how much public support needs to be provided. Keep in mind, one of the things that uh, um, we see in financial models, sometimes one of the reasons they can be seductive in the sense that we find that we can pull together almost all measures of the performance of a project. It's all right there on our screen. We can see it. Uh, on, our, on our monitors, and sometimes we get a, John calls this, a false sense of precision. We have here pro forma, meaning an estimate. We think the project will cost this much. We think demand will cost this much. Here's how the project we think will perform. Let's go first to the time value of money, 10,000 shillings. Let's say I give you the choice. I'll either give you 10,000 shillings today or you can have the same 10,000 shillings, but one year from today. Which would you rather have? Would you have 10,000 shillings from me today or 10,000 shillings one year from today? Okay, why? You can trust me. If I tell you I'll give it to you in one year, you can trust that I'll give it to you in one year. Why would you rather have it today? Go ahead. It's because the value of money changes with, with time. Okay. The value of money today is not the, value, the same value of money tomorrow. Or the next year. Okay. Yeah. 
what if I gave you 10,000 shillings today, is there something that you could do so that one year from today you wouldn't just have 10,000 shillings, you would have more than 10,000 I, in I invest it. Okay, yes. Yeah, yeah. Such as, I don't know, something low risk. Yes. No risk investment. Treasury bills or treasury, treasury bills. Bonds. Where I can um, put it in a fixed deposit. There you go. Yeah. By the way, what is uh, normal consumer deposits? What interest rates are banks here offering? Can anybody tell me what sort of a benchmark on shillings? What do you? Seven to fifteen percent, somewhere there. Okay, seven to ten percent. Okay, so here I've drawn a picture, and you'll see this picture in this format repeated a couple of times here. Um, some people are more theoretical learners; they like formulas and algebra. Some people are more visual learners. If you can capture it in a picture, they can sort of understand what's going on. This diagram here shows, here we've got the direction of money. If it's a red arrow and it's going up, that means money going away from us. This is time here, one year. If it's a black arrow and it's going down, that's money coming back to us. And this basically says that if the interest rates were 10%, for the sake of nice round numbers, 10,000 shillings over one year at 10% is equal to, what's the future value? 11,000, right? Pretty easy to understand. So this is why we say that money has time value. Because if I tell you, hey, today's your lucky day, I'm gonna pay you one billion shillings. What's your next question gonna be? I'm going to pay you one billion shillings. What's your question going to be? When? 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 Well, in 10 years, of course. Now, is that equal to one billion shillings today? No. And in fact, you'll find that if at 10%, I'm just using a nice round number of 10%, if you were to say, okay, Ned gave me a promise, he'll pay me, 10, uh, he'll pay me one billion shillings in 10 years, I wonder if I could take that to a bank and say, this is yours, but you give me money today, and in 10 years, you'll get the 1 billion shillings from Ned. We say that that's the present value. Actually, the present value ends up being less than a half billion shillings. So that's effect of the, the time value plus the, uh, in this case, the interest rate. So we say that money has time value. That when we're doing these financial analyses and models, we're not only thinking about how much money, how much money will the project earn, how much money will it cost to build the project. Instead, we're asking not just how much, but when is that happening? Do PPP projects happen over a long period of time? They do, that's typically one of the things that defines a PPP. It's not the one-time delivery of commodities or equipment or materials, it's delivery of services, and typically it's over a long period of time. So there's a very important impact of the time value of money on PPP projects. So here's something, here's the algebra, for those of you who are mathematicians or really like uh, formulas. Here is the algebra that calculating how much money we will have at a future date, given an initial investment, a time period, and an interest rate, that is called future valuation. And oftentimes we can do that in our head, especially for, for uh, simple numbers. Future valuation, it also requires something we call compounding. So here is, we say the future value, it equals our present value, that'd be 10,000 shillings times one plus r, where r is the annual interest rate, to the nth power, where n is the number of years. So here is an example. I don't want you to do the math. I don't want you to calculate this. I want to test your gut feeling. If we have 10,000 shillings, and now we're not doing it for one or two years, but 10 years, and giving you an interest rate of 12%, how much would you guess approximately? What does your gut tell you? How much do you intuitively think you would have at the end of 10 years? Do you think it would double? Do you think we would have 20,000 in 10 years? 
Do you think it'd be more than double? Yes. It actually turns out in this case, <sighs> sorry, I had the number in my head. I think it's about 32, if I'm not mistaken. There's a rule of thumb, a rule of thumb that's uh, kind of easy to remember, which is that at 10% interest, money will double every 7.2 years, approximately. That's a rule of thumb. John and I are old enough where we remember that if you wanted to make these kind of calculations and actually figure them out, do you remember where you'd have to go and look for them? You'd have to look for tables at the back of books. So at the back of finance books, you'd have to say, OK, approximately, it's about x number of years. Here's about the interest rate. Here's the factor. I multiply by that, and I get an approximate answer. I'm old enough to remember that, yes. Um, now, we've got spreadsheets and calculators that do that very easily, but I at least want you to understand some of the algebraic roots. So if we have a term that's not 7 and a quarter years, it's 10 years. And if we have an interest rate of 12%, not 10%, we're going to end up with something that is more than double or less than double? More than, yeah. And here's where, again, I, I just want you to get an intuitive feel for the numbers that you'd say, wow, over 10 years at 12%, it would triple approximately. I can get you the exact number, but. What I want you to do is at least when you see these numbers in spreadsheets, does it make sense to you? All right. So that is, as we say, the future value changes with the, the term. If we were to make it two years instead of 10, obviously that's one factor. Also the interest rate. If we make the interest rate 12% instead of 2, that's another factor that changes. So we now know how to do something called future valuation. And I want you to see in a graph here, again, that if you had 1,000 shillings here and you were to leave it in for 20 years, quite a long period of time, for 20 years, if you were offered an interest rate of 5%, your uh, terminal value here after 20 years, your 1,000 shillings would grow to a little under 3,000 shillings. That's at 5%. You see here at 10%, your 1,000 shillings is actually going to be almost 7,000. And if you got 15%, here's where you see the effect of compounding, i.e. earning interest on interest, going up so that 1,000 shillings over 20 years is like 17,000 shillings. Money itself doesn't grow, but money is something that can be more easily measured. But money is a substitute for something that we've known for thousands of years that does grow over time, like livestock, like seed grain. Any experienced herder could probably tell you, well, if you give me this group of cattle, how many male, how many female, you tell me what their age is, and I have an idea of where I could graze them, and I allow for certain risks. Some may die due to sickness or disease. I may need to slaughter some of them so that uh, uh, I can feed my family in the meantime. But I have an idea of how much I will have at a future date. Depends on the, uh, how long it takes to breed, when they become of breeding age. So one of the things that I want to let you know is sometimes financial analysis looks pretty complicated. We talk about all these terms, future valuation and compounding and other things. It might make it more simple if you think, well, money is just a medium of exchange for something that actually does grow. Money itself does not grow. What we can invest money in actually does grow. And it'd be fun someday to teach a whole class on finance just doing nothing but using the terms of animal husbandry or, or seeds. We've got the same concept as of risk, climate risk, weather risk, predators. Uh, you name it, but money is a substitute for something that does grow. This is why you will also hear terms about organic growth. Can a business grow sustainably? We call that organic growth, where it's actually coming from, and here's another term, it's internal growth. We're earning interest on interest. 
Does that make sense? Interest on interest would be, well, we're either growing more seeds or we're producing more offspring who, then be can, who can then breed and we will earn a return on, on those as well. If I tell you I'll pay you one shilling one year from today, is the present value of that more or less than one shilling? Less. All right. And as it shows here, we bring a future value back to the present. I've shown you that. I've also shown you in the diagram <clears throat> it shrinks in value. It reduces in value. Anybody know a, another word for a reduction? What is another word to reduce? Discount. Yes. You've probably heard the word before, discount. If you purchase something, maybe if you purchase in bulk, somebody will give you a discount, reduce the price per unit. So this is the process called discounting. And keep in mind that PPP projects, they last for a long period of time. Oftentimes we have projections, or as John said, pro forma, that the project will probably earn this much revenue or pay this amount of money each year in the future. What we might want to do is say, yeah, but how much is that worth today? Similar to like when I, uh, I teased you with that other example saying, I'll pay you a billion shillings. And then I say, ah, but that'll be in 10 years. And then you want to know, well, is there any way that I could monetize that today? Is there any way I could take that promise from Ned and turn it into cash today? Yes, what you have to do though, is you have to go through the process of discounting, meaning what is the present value of a billion shillings in 10 years. What is that worth today? So we bring that back here to the present. It's reduced in value. And before investors invest in PPP projects, most of them want to know how much are these future cash flows that I project I'm going to get? How much are they worth to me today? So notice that when we do the present valuation, we call the process not compounding, but discounting. And instead of calling it the interest rate, the interest rate is when we go forward in time and we compound. Instead of calling it the interest rate, what do we call it? Anybody want to guess? We call it the discount rate. Yeah, very good. So you know a couple of terms now. Future valuation, compounding, interest rate. Now we also know present valuation, discounting, and the discount rate. Let's say you are asked to analyze a proposed PPP project. PPP project is to provide the fleet of buses for a bus rapid transit project. And I'm going to give you some nice round numbers. Hope it makes it easy. The initial investment, i.e. the cost of buying the fleet of buses, is $50 million. Uh, we're going to assume that there's a one-year startup period. So you buy it today, you start getting your cash flow one year from today. The projected revenues in this PPP are to start at $41 million per year and grow at a rate of $2 million a year for 10 years. And the operating costs, that would be the fuel, the wages, maintenance, uh, other operations and costs, would start at $33 million and grow at one million per year. How much is this project worth today? In other words, would it have a positive or a negative net present value? So let's try and see how we would approach this. Okay, so one of the things that I do in this case, I graph out the cash flows. I'm also showing you that we've got a project here that in year zero, time zero today, we've got 50 million dollars that goes away from us, so that's a negative number in red, also shown here. In year one, I said that according to our projections, we're saying that we would get 41 million in revenue. We would have 33 million in costs, meaning that the net cash flow back to the investor is 8 million. And the next year, we say that revenues increase to 43, Operating costs increased to 34. Now we get 9 million, 10, et cetera, going up from 8 million to 17 million. And you can graph it here. So in order to calculate the, present, the net present value, you need an initial investment, 
which we had, that's 50 million. You need net cash flows, which I gave you here. Those are uh, over time, 8, 9, 10, going up to 17. You need the period of time. What else do you need that I didn't give you yet? You need a discount rate. OK, let's see how that works here. Well, first, let's, let's look at the impact of a discount rate before I give one uh, uh, to you. Here I've got two projects that are identical. So this one here, this cash flow, and this one here, they're identical. <coughs> Trust me, because I just copied and pasted, so they're identical. The only difference between these two projects is on one of them, I'm going to use a high discount rate. When I use a high discount rate, and I calculate the present value of these future cash flows, what happens to them when I discount them and I bring them back to the present? Do they keep their value or do they lose their value? At a high discount rate. Yeah, you'll see that if I use a high discount rate, I bring these back to the present, and this number, the blue arrow, you could say looks pretty small. Does this project look like it has a positive or negative NPV? Negative. Looks negative. Now, with this project, same project, same cash flows, I'm going to use a very low discount rate. When I bring these cash flows back to the present, do they keep their value, much of their value or do they lose it? They keep it, a lot of it. So does this project look like it has a positive or negative NPV? OK, it looks positive. So one of the things it shows you is simply by using a different discount rate, we can take a project that might have a, <laughs> we can change or determine the NPV just by using different discount rates, which means that the discount rate we select is very important. If we happen to use a high discount rate, it can look like it's negative NPV. When you have negative NPV, it's like telling an investor, take our bus rapid transit project, you come and invest $50 million of your own money today, and we'll give you back $40 million of your own money today. In other words, <laughs> it would be like losing $10 million today. That would be an example of a negative NPV. That's what it essentially uh, uh, is saying. Any rational investor would probably not accept that. They would say, well, <laughs> Why would I accept the likelihood that I would get a loss? I am looking for opportunities of positive NPV. I'm looking for an opportunity of saying, I take all of the risk and uncertainty, the effort of investing 50 million today, and if I manage it well, it's like getting 70 million back. And in that case, if my, the, present, the sum of the present value of my future cash flows was 70 million, what would my NPV be? It'd be like $20 million. Yes. OK, so here is the question then. What is the, if the discount rate is so important, simply by changing the discount rate, we can change if a project has a positive NPV or a negative NPV. What is the discount rate? What does it represent? What does it mean? Say again. You said risk. Yes. Risk is a four-letter word to most investors. It means it represents all of the risk or uncertainty an investor faces when they undertake that investment. Keep in mind, as John said, when we do a pro forma, when today we say, well, we project, coming back here, we project the investment cost will be $50 million. We project that the revenue will be this amount. In reality, we could be subject to a number of risks could be that maybe the costs of buying buses actually increases. It's not 50 million, but there's a likelihood it could be 55 million. Maybe the revenues that we are expecting, it's a big difference if those revenues come from market and demand risk, meaning ridership risk, or maybe these revenues are an availability payment from a public contracting authority, which is very little risk. As long as you make the service available, you're not subject to market and demand risk. Let me start out in this case. Let's say we have a road project. And we want to 
fund and undertake construction and maintenance of a road project, maybe for 20 years. And we're going to tell our investor that you're going to get all of your, it's going to be a concession. All of your revenues will come from tolls that you collect on the road. And we don't know how much traffic there's going to be because we haven't built the road yet. We've sort of made some estimates, so there's uncertainty there. Your, the other thing that is a, a, a high source of uncertainty in the real world is uh, who determines how many riders ride a toll road? Who determines how many, how the traffic on a toll road? Convenience of the road or infrastructure. If it, convenience. if it is good, it's convenient to the users, it will attract the users. So it's the users who decide. Yes, users. Each individual user exactly. decides. One of the things that we see in cases like this is it's notoriously difficult to predict traffic on a road when you're going to toll it, especially if people aren't used to paying tolls. When you start charging somebody for something that they used to think they were getting for free, you're paying for it with your petrol taxes or whatever, and you say, well, no, tomorrow there's going to be a toll on this road. You will get riders who will say, how dare you? <laughs> I'm not going to pay for that. That's actually costing me money. And uh, so there's a number of sources of uncertainty. You might have a road in this case, no traffic guarantee, no history of collecting tolls. We don't really know how much ridership's going to be. That could be higher risk. What if you were to say, let's take that same road, but traffic risk is too great a level of risk for a private concessionaire to undertake. Traffic could be way too low. Maybe they couldn't cover costs. So what we will do is we will make the road available based on availability payments or annuity payments. It means you build the road, you maintain it. We will pay you a fixed amount each year as long as you meet the output standards. You have to keep it uh, well maintained, and we'll pay you for 10 years or 20 years, regardless of what the level of traffic is. In fact, maybe we'll have a two-part tariff. One covers your fixed costs. A second one covers some of your variable maintenance costs with the level of traffic. Which one is higher risk for our private partner? Availability payments or a full concession? Concession. So you might say, oh, OK. I've got one example here. If it's a full concession, no traffic guarantee, higher risk, we would inspect, expect the investor would require a higher, would use a higher discount rate. For this one, if the traffic risk is essentially taken away from them, a lower discount rate. So I want you to understand this because we'll see that as the discount rate reflects risks, and if we find that a project is too risky, for even to be bankable, then we can look at risk allocation or public sector risk sharing. And we can use our financial models to test, to test these things out. Is risk objective or is risk subjective? So is my idea of what's risky the same as your idea of what's risky? It would be a really, really boring world if we all had the same understanding and valuation of risk. In fact, we would almost have no basis for trade or for markets, because in markets, what we oftentimes find in any market, I have something that I have that I think is higher risk. You may say, no, Ned, I think that's low risk. And I say, good, would you like to buy this? And you'd say, yes, I'd gladly buy it. And we both end up winning from the transaction. So <clears throat> risk is inherently subjective. What we try to do, at least in investment analysis, is we, have, we understand that different investors will have different valuation of risk. Usually in PPPs, what we would like to do is award our contracts with the partners who think it is the, <laughs> who use the lowest discount rate because they think it's the lowest risk. If you hold everything else equal, we would say that's the person who's going to value the project the highest, or they might need the least revenue to cover the costs of all of those risks. So there's two real ways that a, a, a discount rate can be computed. One really is the bottom-up approach. And this is the way that I would say, theoretically, we understand this. And that is, if we come back to this diagram, we would say, ah, if we were to assign a percentage point to each one of these risks and just sum them up, the total amount, the discount rate, would reflect the sum total of each of these risk valuations. 
So if we said technology and design risk, that's 2.5% and construction risk is 1.5 and we add all these up, we could come up and say, ah, we come up with a discount rate of 16%. At least theoretically we could do that. <coughs> In practice, almost no investor does that. Very few investors uh, will value risks that way. That's sort of how we understand it. In practice, what we will oftentimes do is use what we call market comparable approaches. That an investor will say, I think that this project that you're asking me to bid on or to consider is more risky than this group of investments that I'm used to, less risky than this group, so I'm going to use a discount rate somewhere in the middle. I'm going to compare it. Um, so it's answering the question, what are the discount rates for other comparable investments in the same or similar sectors? Uh, now in order for this to work though, you've got to actually have data available on <coughs> what are the returns in the same sector or in similar sectors. So for example, if you were to say, well, there are no other PPP bus terminals yet in Tanzania or in East Africa, um, you might say, well, it's very difficult then to compare it. I don't have much benchmark data to compare it with. Um, so understand that this is how uh, typically it would work. Here we have showing the, re the relationship between risk and return. And risk is, uh, is measured by, or we measure risk through the discount rate. So here we would have low risk, here we have high risk. Here we would have the return that the investment would have to offer. In almost any marketplace, anytime you have investors that have choice in the market, you kind of expect to see this red line here of saying, well, firstly, number one, we have a virtual risk-free rate of return. You could take virtually no risk and still earn a return. What would that be? What would be, what, what typically in most markets is, uh, provides the benchmark risk-free rate of return? Government bonds. Government bonds, yes. The most credit-worthy uh, borrower in the entire market. <coughs> And we say that's virtually risk-free. Um, you can earn a rate of return there. But as you ask an investor to take on more risk or more uncertainty, any rational investor would say, OK, I'll do it, but I require a higher return. All right? So, and here we see that along this line, we would say that the, you could say that the risks and the rewards are in a balance point. Uh, I'll just euphemistically say that. Along this line, we'd say that the investments have an NPV of zero, that there is at least a, th this is where the balance is. And you'd find that most investments fall along this line, fall along this red line. Um, that would be the capital asset pricing model. But it, it, in order for it to work, you've got to have man choice in the market. And you could do things like, well, I could do treasury bonds. Maybe I could do real estate. Maybe I could do uh, the IT sector. More risk, uh, but higher returns uh, expected. Now keep in mind that when we go out on this line here, if we were to invest in something like C, investment C or out here is higher risk, this is the expected average. The red line says that's our expected average. An average of a range that increases as we, this is what we mean by risk. So I've tried to draw the, um, the normal distribution here of saying that even at this point, we expect risk or uncertainty, which means that on average we would expect it to be here, but it really could be anywhere across this, uh, this range here. And as you add in more risk, this is what we mean. Here's the average, but it could mean it could be higher than that, that's what risk means, uncertainty, or it could be much lower than that, including losing your money, right? That's what we mean by risk. So it doesn't mean that just because we take investment C, we are guaranteed of this return. We're exposed to the uncertainty. So let me ask you uh, here then, if I were to offer you the choice between two investments that have the same expected return, A and B, same expected return, right? They, they, if we look at the horizontal axis, they've got the same expected rate of return. Which would you rather take, A or B? Rather take A. 
Well, why? They have the same expected rate of return. What's the difference? Lower risk. You could say that if you take B here, you're taking all of this additional risk, and you're getting no expected additional return for it. So you could say, well, same expected return, but here I have more confidence that I'll get this rate of return. Here I'm exposed to all this additional uncertainty. OK, so now I say, great then. Why don't I give you two investments with the same expected level of risk? Or you accept that they have the same level of risk, which are B and C. Which would you rather take, B or C? C. Any rational investor would. If I'm going to take the additional risk, I'd rather have the higher expected return, right? OK, so now what if I offer you the choice between A and C? The real smart investors. So gosh, another agriculture reference. We've said that money uh, grows sort of like cattle or livestock. Have you ever heard the expression, don't put all of your eggs in one basket? At least that's what I remember. What does that mean? It means diversification. If you put all of your money just in one investment, you bear the risk that that one investment might fail. Diversification means what if you put some of your money in C, some of your money in A, some of your money here in the risk-free rate of return. This is sort of portfolio theory, but basically saying that when you diversify, you're going to get the highest uh, uh, return with the lowest variability. You're not subject to any one investment uh, um, failing. Uh, so one of the things that I want to point out here is when we structure PPP projects, we pick the, picking the discount rate is subjective. We do it through comparison. Um, but that we, sometimes I have seen regulators may do this as well, say, you know, <clears throat> I understand that the industry faces this level of risk, but if we offer them a higher rate of return, that's going to drive up tariffs and prices for end users, right? So let's just fix it right there. Would any rational investor, if they had the choice of A, a B, or C, would any rational investor pick B? No, they wouldn't. And this is what we mean by bankability and sustainability, which is we have to offer a a uh, rate of return commensurate with the risks that they take. And in fact, when you do go out to market with PPP projects, do you think investors are looking for ones like A or C with an expected NPV of zero? Do you think that's what they're going after? What are they going after? They're going after opportunities like D. For all the risks that I am taking, and there are many risks, infrastructure is notoriously risky. The stakeholder management problems alone would make you lose your hair, right? But um, they're looking for opportunities to earn positive NPVs uh, for all the trouble that they're taking, especially when they've got alternatives. You've got to convince them, we undertake this project and you have an opportunity to earn an attractive rate of return, not just a, an NPV of zero. If you want to take no risk, you could go ahead and park your money in treasuries. But we've got to provide a compelling reason for why our project is strong enough and attractive enough to warrant all the additional risks that they take. So here's another look at typically then when we say the market comparable approach, let's compare our project X. And it's going to be subjective. Like you might say, well, I would say that X, project X, given my description of it, would be about this point here. The discount rate would be lower. Somebody else might say it should be higher. You compare it to others. You decide where it is you're going to plot it. But it's got to be plotted essentially so that given the level of risk, you're offering a uh, <coughs> uh, risk commensurate uh, rate of return there in that case. Calculating a PPP investment's NPV, in order to do that, you have to know the discount rate. And this is where, again, I say don't rely on any one number to tell you if a PPP is, uh, or any investment, is uh, uh, viable or attractive or sustainable. I've seen this far too often where some say, yeah, we've done the analysis and the NPV is positive. And I often say, hey, I'm a modeler. I know how to make NPVs positive. How do you do that? <laughs> 
You just, what discount, my next question is really, what discount rate did you use? And then you say, okay, and the discount rate is subjective, and why is it you came up with this? Sometimes there are analysts who can say, well, actually, we have compared it to a, a database or we've benchmarked it about 20 different projects that are similar. We've rated it in terms of comparison of these two. Therefore, we, when we use a discount rate of 8%, we're confident that investors through similar projects have been somewhere in the 7 to 9%. I'd say, oh, okay, that's, uh, that's very different. Oftentimes, it's very difficult to defend a discount rate. That's why I typically like to say I don't want to give a single discount rate. The way it should be presented is that it is a range. That you say, based on our analysis, we think that we're going to use a discount rate of somewhere between 12 and 17 percent. But we just don't know. And across this range, we find that the NPV ranges, but that's the best we can do. Anytime somebody says, we've done the analysis, the NPV is positive, it's this much, I tend to sort of say, hmm, what is he hiding? <laughs> and oftentimes the easy answer is you, if, you can, if you assume a discount rate that's low enough, you can make almost any project show a positive NPV. It could be uh, manipulated. So calculating a, P a PPP project's net present value requires assuming a discount rate. It can vary from investor to investor. In order to come up with it with confidence, you've got to have a, uh, 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 comparable investments to compare it to. However, an IRR can be calculated, at least for any project, given here's the initial investment amount, here's what the net cash flows are. We can at least compute an IRR. The next question is, though, is that IRR enough to attract an investor given all the risks that they're going to take? So I would say don't rely on any one single number to do this. Uh, and as you will see that with a number of these, like the NPV, they require making assumptions, like a discount rate, that uh, is a very important assumption and sometimes can be hidden or manipulated. Most private investors, as well as governments, they find it easy to understand and to compare IRRs. Um, NPVs themselves, they actually vary based on the size of the project, the discount rate that you use, etc. Um, yeah, so here is where, again, I say, rather than concluding, here's our project, it has a positive NPV of $6.2 million. The danger and the challenge I oftentimes find, once you go on record saying this, all the decision makers tend to say, you're promising us $6.2 million. I'm holding you to that. You know what it's going to be. And in truth, we don't know what it's going to be. I would say, rather than doing that, I would say something more realistic is to say, well, given comparisons to similar investments in similar countries and in similar sectors, we think that investors will probably assume a discount rate somewhere between 12 and 17 percent. If you can narrow it down further, that's even better. And therefore, across this range, the NPV will be somewhere between, say, 13 and 2 million dollars. That's a more realistic portrayal of what you actually know, so you don't have this problem, as John mentioned, of sort of false precision. There's a difference between a project IRR and an IRR on equity. When we compute an IRR on equity, it's basically we're saying, what is the initial equity investment, which is going to be lower because we say PPPs are leveraged. You're borrowing a lot of money. So for the equity investor, remember they get their cash flows very last at the, the waterfall model. They get those net cash flows at the very end. They put in a little amount of equity up front. They get those net cash flows. We can compute, as we see down here, the IRR on that saying, OK, here is your equity investment. Maybe you're funding 30% uh, of the upfront investment. So 30% is equity, 70% is borrowed as debt. You get the net cash flows here. So after the operating costs have been, and taxes and um, um, the O&M costs have all been paid, you get the net cash flows here. Now we're going to compare these two here. We can compute an IRR on this. 
And so there's an IRR on the equity portion. That's one of the measures that we typically see. What this means, though, is um, the IRR on equity, in order to compute that, we have to make an assumption about how we're going to finance our project. Is it going to be 30% equity, 70% debt? Is it going to be 50-50? And in reality, those decisions are made by the investor themselves when they decide how they want to finance the project with their lenders. What if we wanted to say, let's find out what the IRR is on the project regardless of how it's financed? Does that make sense? Rather than making an assumption or trying to guess, no, 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 the investor is going to use 20% equity. No, 40%. We're going to come up with different IRRs on equity based on how we decide to finance the project with debt and equity. Another measure that we want to show is the project IRR. What is the IRR on the whole project regardless of how it is financed? The simple assumption on that is what if it is an all equity project? There is no debt. That's what we mean by project IRR, also called the unlevered IRR. Well, in this case, we're counting the whole capital investment, not just the equity portion, but the whole capital investment, so this is large. We're counting all of the cash flows after we've paid the operating costs. So we just pay the operating costs and everything else left over, that's our net cash flow. This is, would be the project IRR. So it means we've got a higher initial investment. We actually pay higher taxes because of, uh, uh, we don't get the tax deduction on interest. And we'll get higher net cash flows. But the IRR will be lower than the IRR on equity. The IRR on equity is saying, let's just look at the equity portion. That's what an investor would typically be most interested in. We'll look at these, these cash flows are going to be lower here because we're paying off our lenders first at a nice low interest rate. And now we're getting a higher IRR on equity. This is what we also call the beauty of leverage or the beauty of being able to borrow other people's money to pay for your investment. You pay them a lower interest rate and you get a higher return on your equity. I'll give you now some numbers that actually will illustrate this. Let's take a simplified example of a PPP project. So let's say it's a municipal large municipal solid waste treatment and disposal facility. Maybe it's waste energy, let's say. The total capital investment here is $200 million. We're going to assume that we'll finance it 50% debt, 50% equity. Uh, we'll borrow money for eight years, paying 10% interest. We're also going to have some, um, this is getting a little advanced here, but some depreciation. That means we have lower taxes. Our proposed revenues are starting at $100 million per year. Our operating and maintenance costs are 55. We pay these taxes. Now, looking at this basic data, I'll show you at least on one page, how we would illustrate the IRR on equity and then the project IRR. So if you can see this, here we have our capital investment worksheet. The yellow numbers here, you should know this, the, the ones highlighted in yellow, these are input assumptions. So these are assumptions that our model can allow us to change. We could decide to analyze the question, what if we were to raise the capital investment cost by 10% and make this 220 or not? We have how much debt and how much equity, 50-50. We've got a term on our debt of eight years and an interest rate of 10%. But here we show, well, we'll talk about the difference between income and cash flow. What it basically means is we have revenues of 100. We have operating costs of 55. Uh, we have net cash flow then available to pay things like debt uh, of 45. We subtract these here, we get net cash flow to the equity investor. So here, if you see on this line, net cash flow to equity investor, starts out as negative 100. Why is it negative? Well, during the construction yeah, that is their investment during construction. They put in, here it is, 100 million. That's 50% of the total investment. So the equity investor puts in 
100 million, that's their initial investment. Their cash flow then for year one is 21.26. Then we see the cash flows continue here over time. We compute the IRR on that set of cash flows. And the IRR again is the discount rate that would produce an NPV of zero, right? And what is that in this case? How much is it here? What is the number, the IRR on equity? 17.5, yes. If you want to do a little bit of comparison here, which do you think should be higher, the interest rate on debt or the IRR on equity? Who takes more risk? Who takes more risk? Lender or the equity investor? The equity investor takes more risk. They have to wait last to get repaid. So you see that the interest rate on debt, if you were a lender, you'd be making 10% and you'd be taking less risk. If you're the equity investor, you're making 17.5%. You're taking more risk, as you'd expect. So this is the IRR on equity. But this IRR is based on this decision of 50% debt, 50% equity. Here's a bit of an advanced question, but I think some of you are ready for this. What happens if instead of 50-50 debt equity, I were to say it's only 20% equity and 80% debt? What do you think would happen to the IRR on equity if now I borrow 80% debt and I'm only putting in 20% as equity? What do you think would happen to the IRR on equity? What do you think might happen? Huh? The IRR on equity. The more other people's money you borrow, the more your return is going to go up. Say, let's look at the project. Let's have a measure of the project that just looks at uh, the return on the project overall. Simplified assumption of that. What if it were a 100% equity deal? Not realistic, but we want to at least measure it. So if it were 100% equity, we have the same revenues, got the same operating costs. We have no debt to pay. We also get no interest deduction. And what we find down here is, look, instead of 100 here, we've got 200. We've doubled our equity investment. Our net cash flows are higher. Before they were uh, in the 20s, now they're up at 36 and 3 quarters. But what happened to the IRR for the project? Is it higher or lower? Lower. lower. So what we understand here, and again I want you to, to understand that don't believe any one single number that defines uh, the, the performance of a project but exp require this of your advisors and want to look at this. You want to look at the project from all angles. Now that you are familiar with some of the basic techniques of financial analysis, you can test your knowledge on these techniques by taking the following short quiz that will display on your screen shortly. Please answer each question, either true or false.
Here are some takeaways. Financial analysis requires an understanding of revenue, costs, and financing, and that financial analysis is critical in determining public-private partnership feasibility. I'd like to provide you with some additional takeaway points from this first module dealing with time value of money calculations. The first point is that, as the title implies, money has time value. So when we talk about an amount of money, the next thing that we want to know is when do we need to pay that amount or when will we receive it? Secondly, for PPP projects that occur over a long period of time, 10 or 20 years, the impact of time on these valuations can be quite significant. Third, the fairest way to actually compare different costs spread out over time is through the process of present valuation. When we do present valuation, or discounting as we call it, we're comparing money today with money today. And then finally, when we do present valuations, understand that this process requires selecting a discount rate. Understand the discount rate reflects all of the risks or uncertainties we face in actually realizing those cash flows. And that risk is fundamentally a subjective phenomenon. My idea of risk is going to be different from your idea of risk. I'd like to thank you for joining us for this first module on time value of money calculations. We hope you'll join us for module two, dealing with PPP risk identification, as well as financial statement analysis. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.